coming. I'm very excited about this panel. I'm just your lowly moderator today. Uh, so my job is just to showcase the three wonderful panelists we have in front of us. And uh, I'll announce the order. Francisco Aragon will read, I'm sorry, speak first. And then Kirsten Valdez, it's Quaid, right? Quaid will, will speak next. And then um, Hector Garcia Chavez will actually finalize things for us. So I'm gonna start by introducing Francisco and I'll just get up and introduce each speaker as we work through the panel so that the, the biographies are fresh in your head. Good, okay. Francisco Aragon is the author of two books of poetry, Puerta del Sol with Bilingual Press and Glow of Our Sweat, Scapegoat Press, as well as the editor of the award-winning anthology, The Wind Shifts, New Latino Poetry with the University of Arizona Press. His third full-length book of poetry, After Ruben, is forthcoming in 2020 with Red Hen Press. Among his distinctions are Outstanding Latino Latina Cultural Arts, Literary Arts and Publications Award given by the American Association of Hispanics in Higher Education, which is the AAHHE, as well as being a finalist for the Split This Rock Freedom Plow Award for Poetry and Activism. He has performed his poetry widely at universities, galleries, bookstores, and festivals, including the Dodge Poetry Festival. And he's on the faculty of the University of Notre Dame's Institute for Latino Studies, where he directs Letras Latinas, the ILS's literary initiative, and teaches courses in Latinx poetry and creative writing. A native of San Francisco, California, he divides his time between South Bend, Indiana, and the Washington, D.C. area. His presentation is going to reflect on the work of four Latinx poets with this um, interest or question about migration and the Catholic experience. Thank you, Gina. Dana Joya's essay, The Catholic Writer Today, was, for me, an invitation to consider how our work as writers could be described as emerging from a worldview he describes as Catholic. Although there were many passages that spoke to me, a couple of phrases that stood out were, quote, a mystical sense of continuity between the living and the dead, and a habit of spiritual self-scrutiny, to name two. Our session this afternoon inserts Latinx identity into the mix. The idea I've been kicking around for a few years now is this notion of migration. I can start with the fact that I am the product of migration, the journey my parents took in the late 50s from Nicaragua to San Francisco, the city I was born and raised in. When I survey the landscape of US Latinx poetry, it seems to me that this might be one of the things we bring to the table, that our work typically includes, literally or metaphorically or spiritually, a story about migration, a journey that can be imbued with what Dana Joya calls a longing for grace and redemption. This afternoon, I just want to briefly introduce four Latinx poets. They are Natalia Trevino, Orlando Ricardo Menes, Gina Franco, and Oliver Baez Bendorf. Natalia Trevino, author of a full-length book called Lavando la Dirty Laundry from 2014, published a chapbook last year called Virgin X. The poet Sheila Black characterizes the collection as a, quote, sweeping, swirling aria of a book exploring with tenacity, humor, sorrow, and grit the many faces of La Virgen. One could say that a work like Virgin X, written by a woman born in Mexico who migrated to Texas as a child, could be emblematic of a so-called Catholic Latinx poet. And yet Trevino writes in a solicited testimonio, quote, since I am divorced and remarried, 
unrepentant for this, and therefore apparently going to hell for this sin, according to my bias, pious dias in Mexico, I am wary of the laws written by the men in control of the Catholic message and its misogynistic cultural traditions. My book challenges that patriarchal idea of God by exploring the feminine divine, the forces of creation, and forging a deep study of the woman who is called Mother of God by the church itself. I wanted to share part three of a poem from that book, and it's titled, Migrating La Virgen. O oh, Lady of San Juan de los Lagos, your eyes do not look down at us half shut. It is your dream, the whole earth you carry above your head where we do not fight for land, and we do not cross one another or jagged borders with our own travel-sized miracles. Miracle of a bottle of water, miracle of a photograph tucked under a bra, miracle of a sandwich shared, made three million times, hundreds of miles away. You want us to swim in the one ocean, El Mar, Maria, your populated effigy. Great Mother Earth, as the dream, as the dreamer. I've crossed the brown Rio Grande 300 times or more with my green card, then my blue card, while other children crawled across pale deserts, hid under the helicopters, bridged the two lands in question with their water bottles and work and bones. Madre de misericordia, mother of misery, of mercy. The difference between these children and me was the color of our papers. We have papers, my father always said, papers. Though I'd asked once if he could tell my mom to please dry my back better after my shower so the kids would stop it, stop saying it, because somehow my back stayed wet all day long. You have the same name as my grandmother's, Maria de Socorro, Mother of Mercy. I am still learning the difference between the prayer and the one who prays. Orlando Ricardo Menes was born in Lima, Peru, to Cuban parents. At age 10, his family migrated to Miami and shortly thereafter to Madrid, Spain, where they lived for a couple of years before migrating back to Miami. Menes has lived in South Bend, Indiana for the last 20 years. His fifth book of poetry from 2015, titled Heresies, is titled Heresies. Among the pieces in this volume are a series of dramatic monologues in the voices of invented saints. Of this particular strand of his work, Menes writes, quote, our medieval forebears made no hard separation between the imagined and the real, an approach that still reverberates to this day, among writers at least. He goes on to say, I admit my poetics is one of transgression, yet I do not define this term in ways that suggest irreverence or worse, violation. In my mind, the prefix trans suggests a crossing over, a weaving together, a joining of the past and the present, the historical and the mythic, the personal and the public. And this is one of his invented saints. Saint Dorothy, patroness of bartenders. Carouse in my cantina, all you drunkards, louts, good-for-nothings, vent your troubles at my altar of hooch. Confess with wine, rugged Riojas and Riveros, guzzle shots of faith, drafts of hope, charity's highball. Why should, why should worship be temperate? Swill, jag, and quaff, dance the Sambuca, Wiggle to grappa, spread my gospel to the water drinkers, catechize, catechize with cordials, muddle mojitos for mass. 
shake and strain cocktails. To abstain is mortal sin. Beware of teetotalers who scorn the Eucharist, tempting with grape juice or ginger beer. <laughs> Heretics who deny that God's clouds rained alcohol, life's water on the seventh day. Praise be to his seven spirits, gin, vodka, whiskey, rum, tequila, brandy, and schnapps. O oh, mother of God, Virgen de Guadalupe, we offer you this Assumption Day, no vulgar Bloody Marys, but tequila blancas, Jerusalem bitters, a garnish of prickly pear. <laughs> Gina Franco, who read for us yesterday afternoon, is about to publish her second full-length book of poems titled The Accidental. I would venture to say that Franco's collection and work in general, where this question of the Catholic literary tradition is concerned, emerged from what I'll call the contemplative. Franco, when offering a reflection, writes, in part, it's not an opposition against the aesthetics of atheism, nor secular humanism, nor against any perceived threat of religious otherness. Rather, for me, it is a faith in the contemplative, incarnational work of making poems where I can, where I can ask God the hard questions about evil, suffering, injustice, hatred, and longing but also about beauty, love, sacrifice, reality, and awe. Franco's work deploys a kind of Baroque yet intimate lyricism that a reader must attentively unpack. Tidy and linear narratives, these are not. And yet there are poems that, in passages, hint at narrative, but on a larger, more oblique, yet elegant canvas. And so I would argue one of the distinctions of Franco's work is that it is adding to that strand of Latinx poetry that emerges from more innovative, less predictable tendencies in Latinx literature. Let me just share one excerpt from the title poem, The Accidental. Then the soul lost sight of the father too, the soul turning its wound to the horizon where the fire was no longer visible, the soul turning inward, wanting. Thus, when loneliness took root, it grew limbs. It grew a tensile, nervous lattice of branches racing into the cavity at the center of its head, under its skin, into its cranium and eyes so that through the brambles shuddering in its crown, the soul saw something of itself with its own eyes turned inward. Eyes for the picking, clustered like cherries. And as the soul's eyes filled with lust for more visions, more eyes plumped into being. A mass of capillaries seized in the mouth of the question cutting teeth in all the mouths at the heart of it. And each had a sound for what it closed on, uniform though incredulous. Here I am. It was the sound of a feast. Startled aloud, the owls rose up with wings and a furl of calls from their roosts on the crags. The soul plucked pulp from the thorns, brought it through the brambles, brought it witting to its mouth. I am who that is who. The fourth and final poet I want to bring to your attention is Oliver Baez Bendorf. He is the author of two full-length books, The Spectral Wilderness and Advantages of Being evergreen. But once again, I want to focus, as I did with Natalia Trevino, on a chapbook slated for publication this fall titled The Gospel According to X. Of it, Bias Bendorf writes, confession as a mode shaped the contours of my adolescence. 
And when I fell into the arms of public school for high school, I believe I kept with me the paradigm of sin without a corresponding paradigm for redemption. Poetry became that for me, as well as queer community. So when I write in my chat book, The Gospel According to X, where X is, a, is figured in moments as a sort of trans Jesus figure, I want to tell him he does not need to confess himself, does not need to be sorry, has not sinned, but what do I know? The chat book is made up of untitled prose poems, and here is the penultimate one. I do believe in something, Lord. I create things. It's heaven to me, being so close to the earth through creation. I made myself into a sun, Lord. I thought it up all by myself, spiritual. Here I am, indeed, holy. I don't know what I believe in, or who, or how much. I just sing holy, holy, holy at nothing in particular. But if all of us are singing, then I don't feel so stupid. Is holy, is together, is forgiven for the sin of being a body. Holy, I still love everybody. Orlando Menace's comment about the prefix trans suggesting a crossing over, a weaving together, a joining of the past and the present, the historical and the mythic, the personal and the public, is useful here, I think, not only in discussing this Latinx poet who identifies as transgender, but also in echoing my earlier remark about migration, whether taken in a literal sense or metaphorical. Thank you. Kirsten Valdez Quaid is the author of the short story collection, Night at the Fiestas, a New York Times notable book, which won the John Leonard Prize from the National Books Critics Circle, and the Sue Kaufman Prize from the Academy of American Arts and Letters. Kirsten is the recipient of a Rome Prize from the American Academy in Rome, a Rana Jaffe Foundation Writers Award, and a Stegner Fellowship. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker and Best American Short Stories, and she's an assistant professor at Princeton. And she has a beautiful story for you today about how she got started as a writer. Thank you, Gina, and thank you to all of you for being here. Um, it is a real gift to be here with all of you and to be having these conversations. Um, I feel incredibly lucky. Um, so as Gina said, I, this is um, a bit about, this is, this is an essay about my first published piece. Um, my first published piece was in a book called The Healing Touch of Mary, referred to in my family as Touched by a Virgin. <laughs> The Healing Touch of Mary is a collection of testimonies by people who had been healed, touched, moved, or otherwise interfered with by the Mother of God. <laughs> it might best be categorized as the kind of book a great aunt might buy you for a confirmation gift and that you probably never read but feel too guilty to give away. It's a chicken soup for the soul, Mariolatry edition. I do not list this publication on my CV. <laughs> And I did not actually submit my piece for inclusion in this book. And in fact, maybe we can all agree between us to keep the fact of its existence a secret. Um, when I was 25 in graduate school studying fiction writing, my grandmother called me from Santa Fe one Sunday afternoon in great excitement to tell me that at mass that day she'd met a writer. A real writer, she clarified. As I did not yet count as a real writer to her, to myself, to anyone. Oh, was she nice, my grandmother said. I told her you wanted to be a writer too. 
I didn't think much of this. My grandmother is always meeting people. In a family full of shy people, my grandmother is the one outlier. She favors bright colors, golds and magentas and pinks and reds, and loves a party. When I was in high school spending summers with her, if we were out for dinner, she'd ostentatiously place her margarita on the table between us so I could take sips. <laughs> she makes friends everywhere, on planes, at the grocery store, in public restrooms. Of course, she'd befriend a new face at mass. Then my grandmother went on to say that she'd invited this real writer home for lunch and had shown this real writer my, quote, beautiful story, unquote, and that this real writer had asked to keep a copy of it. You can see where this is going, but I couldn't. My beautiful story, as my grandmother called it, was my college application essay, written when I was 17. It was about attending mass with my grandmother at the St. Francis Cathedral in Santa Fe. It was also about my special affection for and fascination with the wooden statue of the Blessed Mother brought by the Spanish in 1626 during their conquest of the New World, a bloody conquest they framed as a holy war. This statue was, for centuries, known as La Conquistadora, until in the 1990s her name was changed to Our Lady of Peace. Um, revisionist history, if ever there was, um, from the prayer on a prayer card. O oh, conquistadora, our patroness and queen, through Jesus Christ, the prince of peace, convert all the infidels and enemies of the peace of Christ. Um, also, O oh, conquistadora, our patroness and queen, the woman whose seed will crush the serpent's head. La conquistadora stands two and a half feet tall, her carved face is placid and regal and a little bored looking. Her hair, a wig, is thick and dark under a veil. Sometimes, though not always, she holds a wooden infant Jesus rather loosely in her large, stiff hands. He has to be pinned to her dress, and the startled expression on his face reflects his understanding of his precarious position. La Conquistadora is the oldest continuously venerated image of the Blessed Mother in the United States. She lived in Santa Fe for 50 years until the Pueblo Revolt in 1680, when the Pueblo people retook the land that had been stolen from them by the Spanish. The remaining Spanish settlers fled with the statue. Thirteen years later, the fight was on again. Don Diego de Vargas led the reconquest of Santa Fe and returned the statue to what he proclaimed was her rightful place. She is beloved in Santa Fe. Every June, she's paraded through the streets to the Rosario Chapel, where she stays during the novenas. She has an extensive, extensive collection of valuable jewelry, gem-encrusted crowns, turquoise and silver squash blossom necklaces, and an elaborate wardrobe of over 200 gowns, sewn or commissioned over the centuries by devoted parishioners. One of these dresses was a gift from my grandmother. When I was 11, I went with her to choose the material, a shimmering pink gold paisley lame, exactly the fabric my grandmother might choose for her own gown <laughs> if she were to have one made. From the time I was little, whenever I visited my grandmother, we made a point of going to mass together and paying a special visit to the conquistadora in her chapel. We'd drop quarters into the metal box near the bank of candles, flickering in their red glass holders, and then light new candles of our own. As I prayed, I would feel the old childhood anxiety that I might leave someone out. And gradually, I would become aware of the sounds of the church around me, of a heavy door closing at the back of the cathedral, of other people's steps, of my grandmother kneeling beside me, of my own heartbeat. I'd feel that swelling sense of connection to those who'd prayed to her <clears throat> before me, some of them my own ancestors, and I'd be struck by the vast, untouch untouchable enormity of history and of the heavens and of God himself. After I wrote this essay, I gave my grandmother a copy because I was proud of it and because I wanted her to know what it had meant to me to attend church with her. I gave it to her because I knew she'd love that I had written about her and church. And if I'm perfectly honest, I gave it to her because I knew it would further cement my position as the favorite grandchild. <laughs> Um, maybe don't show that essay to anyone anymore, I said on the phone that afternoon when I was 25. It's embarrassing. 
What's embarrassing about it, my grandmother said. I think it's beautiful that you come to church with me. I wish the rest of my kids would. I wish you'd do it more. I forgot about this conversation until about a year later when I was visiting her. You won't believe what came in the mail, my grandmother said, thrusting a shiny, shining hardcover into my hands. I got you published, Mihika. <laughs> And indeed, there it was, my college application essay <laughs> on page 39 of The Healing Touch of Mary, printed in full among the stories of visions and car accidents and sick children and mended hearts. It was printed under Kirsten Q. Kirsten Q. That truncated attribution both offered me some small measure of solace and offended me even further. <laughs> I was mortified. I felt exposed and humiliated, embarrassed by my teenage self, and angry at the real writer who had, I felt, stolen my work. Stolen wasn't the right word for it, but I didn't have another one. My head swam with arrogance and shame. The essay stank, but surely it was better than the healing touch of Mary. Thank goodness the woman didn't use my full name, but why the heck didn't she use my full name? <laughs> Also, where in the essay had I ever claimed to have been healed by the statue? I recognized that this scenario was pretty funny, and it also seemed to me then absolutely tragic, and I wanted to laugh and to cry. It was my first understanding of how something I'd created could take on a life of its own, could speak for me in ways I didn't want to be spoken for. As I held the book, sitting under my grandmother's elated, expectant gaze, I was in the tricky situation of being simultaneously very, very annoyed with her and also truly touched by her gesture. My grandmother loved that essay, loved that I'd written it, loved the portrayal of herself as someone who was instrumental to her granddaughter's faith. One of her great sorrows is that none of her children had remained in the church, and so my religious bent was a small victory. She knew how much I wanted to be a real writer, and she was pleased with herself for getting me published, for managing so easily to do for me what I had not yet managed to do for myself. <laughs> it didn't occur to my grandmother that I might not be thrilled to show up as Kirsten Q in the pages of Touched by a Virgin. <laughs> it didn't occur to her that her granddaughter could be such a tremendous snob. How could it? How could she guess at the intensity of my secret ambitions? First, she was under the impression that I was a nice girl. <laughs> Second, my grandmother is not herself a reader, which hasn't stopped her from offering me quite a bit of publishing advice over the years. When you finish your book, Heatha, you should tell Oprah. <laughs> Let's set aside for a moment the ethically problematic decision of this real writer to publish without permission and without proper attribution the work of another person. There is a reason writers generally do not hire their grandmothers to be their agents. <laughs> My college application essay, while written with great feeling and earnestness, piles and piles of earnestness, should never have been published. It's terrible and it's saccharine, and like most saccharine writing, it is dishonest, or at least not entirely honest. It doesn't acknowledge the problematic history of La Conquistadora and the fact that she served as the reason and mascot for the brutal forced conversions and subjugation of whole peoples, some of them who are also my ancestors. It doesn't delve at all into my conflicted relationship to Catholicism, to a church that I love, but that so often feels inhospitable to me as a woman, as a queer woman, as a feminist. And it doesn't explore in any meaningful way my relationship with my grandmother, which, while being one of the most profound joys of my life, is also complicated. Because of these omissions, my essay was perhaps less honest than the testimonies offered by the other people in the book, who, I imagine at least, really did feel Mary's arms around them after the car wreck. Many of these testimonies are incredibly moving. These other recipients of Mary's healing touch weren't trying to be writers and hadn't created some teenager's idea of what an essay should be. When I wrote this essay at age 17, I was already beginning to think of myself as a writer, already trying to imagine what it might mean to live a writing life. 
My, ide my ideas of what con constituted a writing life, however, were pretty vague. I didn't know any writers. My mother was the first in her family to go to college. I was a big reader, yet my models were either Anne of Green Gables, who did not exist, or Virginia Woolf, for whom things didn't, for whom things didn't turn out so well. Eight years later, when that essay found its way into print, I was in graduate school, learning about the craft of fiction in earnest. I had a clearer sense of how writers lived in the world, having finally met some living, breathing ones. I was a serious reader of literary fiction and trying hard to be a serious writer of it too. Of course I was embarrassed by this first publication. One thing I didn't notice in the thick of that embarrassment, however, was that eight years later, I was still writing about the themes I had begun to explore in that application essay. The landscape and history of New Mexico, Catholicism, faith, the complicated bonds within families. These are themes that have continued to be obsessions for me. Why is that statue of La Conquistadora so important to me? In some ways, she stands aside from the story of Mary that moves me so tremendously. She doesn't conjure for me the Mary of the Annunciation, that startled young woman who must have been terrified by what was in store for her, and maybe a little proud too, for having to, to have been chosen for the task. Nor does she conjure the terrible pathos of the Pieta, that shocked and grieving mother who had to watch her young son die in the most painful way imaginable, who had to watch his fear, who must surely have doubted her God's goodness. La Conquistadora, poised high in her carved altarpiece, feels so entirely of a particular place and of a particular people, so much a part of a particular history. I imagine her gazing out over four centuries of bowed heads, listening to countless pleas for her intercession. She hears all of our pains and hopes and ambitions, our smallness, our failings. She is witness to how we can use God for our own purposes. She stands as a warning. She has seen terrible violence perpetrated in God's name, and she sees the many acts of goodness committed in his name and those committed not in his name. Mostly, she patiently hears our stories and she understands how sustaining those stories are. It's been a while since my grandmother and I have paid a visit to La Conquistadora. My grandmother is 93. She has Parkinson's disease. Her mobility is limited and she's often in pain. She mostly watches mass on television and a deacon comes by on Wednesdays to bring her communion. When I suggest going to the cathedral, she sighs and says, Oh, Mijita, it takes me so long to dress. And I leave it at that because it's easier on her, but mostly because it's easier on me. But La Conquistadora is waiting. I imagine her wondering where we've been. I think it's time we paid her a visit. Thank you. Panelist, Hector Garcia Chavez. Um, I'm going to say up front, my father uh, really shamed us out of speaking Spanish. I grew up with Spanish speakers, but I am not a Spanish speaker, so I'm about to possibly butcher the most beautiful language on earth. So just bear with me. Thank you. Hector Garcia Chavez is a senior lecturer, a Loyola Sujak master teacher, I was recently awarded the Ignatius Loyola Award for Excellence in Teaching. He is program director of Loyola's Latin American and Latino Studies and teaches courses on the Spanish language, Latin American Iberian literature, Latin American studies, and queer theory. His research interests include masculinity studies in Mexican literature and film, transnationalism and identity in 20th century and 21st century Latin American and Iberian literature, and U.S. Latinx and gender studies. He has most recently given talks on Mexican transnationalism and queer studies at the ACLA, Universidad Iberoamericana, and the UNAM, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. He is presently working on a book project titled Propaganda, Escándalo, Insulto y Provocación. Los comportamientos y fenómenos 
emotivos de la es esfera pública. It's a long title. <laughs> <laughs> With Dr. Ana Maria Serna at the Instituto Mora. In his own words, he says that his, in his presentation, I will be focusing on Chicago popular Mexican religiosity, matriarchy, and La Virgen de Guadalupe. My three showcase Mexican US Latinx writers are Raimundo Salazar, author of The White Rhino, a Latino English teacher's blog, and M. Martinez, Catholic Orderlands Mapping Catholicism onto American Empire, 1905 to 1935, and Elaine A. Benya performing piety, making space sacred with the Virgin of Guadalupe. And as I understand it, these are all speakers from the Hank Mexican conference that you may be addressing. Uh, and then he says he's gonna finalize this presentation, um, focusing on how contemporary US Mexican, Me Mexican X and Latinx artists and their unique Catholic experiences are transforming Catholicism, hegemonic vertical structures, and creating new expressions of inclusion and expanding Catholic identities. Um, the whole thing. Mainly, <laughs> he says, he's gonna finalize this. In short, transnational Catholic Mexican religiosity meets queer theory. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I have a PowerPoint presentation because I have a visual impediment and it's easier for me to speak and see images than it is to read so bear with me. And again, my Mediterranean Mexican Baroque-ness came out in the email. Thank you, Gina, for reading everything I sent you. So I will try to be succinct and direct. I want to thank everyone who, who's here. The invitation came in June when I was in Barcelona, and I was reading Lucia Berlin at the time, and uh, Guadalupe de Del, who I have up there next to other books that inspire me uh, plenty. So I have lots to share. I'm trying to be as succinct and focus on what happened. Um, it'll be five years now with the Hank Center's Mexican Catholic Conference, which was focused on the Mexicans. So again, surprise, I have a long title to share with you. Catholic Mexican Exes. In, in Spanish, we will say Mexicanes. The X is pronounced as an E. In Chicago, Landia and beyond, diverse, dynamic, and ever-expanding Guadalupanes. Uh, I can explain what the X means if you're not too... Uh, in tune with what's happening with U.S. Latinx and also Latinx from a Latin American um, perspective. So again, a little bit about myself when I was asked to speak. It is about the lived experience, and I gather that from the presenters before me um, that what I'm speaking about and presenting will be part of the same conversation. I'm from Durango, Durango, Mexico, which is part of the colonial part of Mexico City, which ends with what is now Nuevo Mexico, which was part of the Spanish colonies for many, 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 many years. So that's the town square in Durango. If you're curious and you might ask, well, what's La Nueva Vizcaya? Vizcaya is Basque, as in Basque country, where San Ignacio de Loyola was born. So it's not Spanish. That's why Durango doesn't sound like other, say, Latin American or Spanish cities. To get a sense of where I'm from, I'm not from Cancun, I'm not from Acapulco. <laughs> I was born at about 2,000 meters, which is about 6,000 feet. So think Colorado and the mountaintops where it snows in the winter uh, can get to about 10,000 feet. So I'm not speaking from a, a place that speaks to sugar skulls, to iguanas in Oaxaca. It's a different type of Mexico. Mexico is mucho Mexico. There are many Mexicos in Mexico. And Chicago is part of that. This is a text that comes from a very dear place in my heart. My mom passed away about five years ago and I inherited two tomes out of four and I'm still looking for the two a religious text that arrived um, from Madrid. You can read this if you want later on, I can share. And it's, these are religious texts that were translated from the French to the Spanish dating 1793. So my Latin class helped. And it has writing from my mother, my grandmother, and my great-grandmother, Jacinta Chavez. And this is all in Northwest Mexico, which is very isolated to this day. How they had a library, um, in the 18th and 19th century is beyond me. Think of Idaho for the time being. Again, I hope I'm not insulting anyone. <laughs> but these books now are in my home, which is where my mother used to live when she lived in Chicago. And I sit and I read, and as a professor of literature, cultural studies, and gender studies, 
I find this fascinating because I read what's part of my family history, which is not part of Chicago Mexican X history. So this is where I'm from. Again, I'm not going to get into it, but when I was thinking about how to present myself, I, I wasn't sure about the public that I would have. Mexico is gigantic. It has three time zones. And if Mexico is big, Argentina and Brazil are even bigger. So keep that in mind. And again, for me, the borderlines and what it means to be Mexicano and Mexicanidad includes the United States. This is Chicago. Uh, many of the maps that you see about from Chicago, or what I call Chicagolandia, are skewed. Actually, two-thirds of the city is on the south side. But if you look at, say, the CTA map or tourist maps that you maybe were presented with as you arrived at your hotel here, you find that the north side looks a lot bigger than it actually is. It, from what is now Chicagolandia proper and Mexican populations were everywhere. Everywhere. The city has maybe, depending on who's counting and how it's being counted, I would say close to four million. Some might d debate that and say it's closer to three. I think it's closer to four. And from those four million that live in Chicago proper, I'm being um, open with how the census is, uh, numbers have, have been, been taken, excuse me. I would say that at least 30 to 40 percent are peoples like myself that speak Spanish at home, either a little or a lot. So that means that the Chicago a Catholic Archdiocese is a large part Spanish speaking, and after Spanish, it's Polish. And it's millions, millions. Cook County, which is the county that is where Chicago is located, and Chicago Landa, which would include about four other counties, certain parts of Indiana, and even southeast um, um, Wisconsin, is about 10 to 11 million. This is an amazing number. That also it means that there are about three to almost 4 million people of Latin American heritage, either first, second, or third generation. For us from Latin America, for me specifically Mexico, being in Chicagolandia is really being in Mexico now. And speaking Spanish is a reality. And we are so diverse, it's very difficult to fully comprehend the idea of people of color for us, and also the Latinx, because some prefer Hispanic, other per prefer Latino. We can discuss that further. So then again, knock, knock. No, where are you? Cuantos somos? How many of us Spanish speakers are there? Are there? What's your nearest Catholic parish? Chicago is amazing. If you just walk around, especially the older parts of the city, you will find that there are many Catholic parishes a block or two blocks away from each other. I'm thinking of a, of a neighborhood which I call La Diciocho, known popularly now as Pilsen, La 26, Old Town, which for some is East Ukrainian Village, etc. It depends if you're a Chicago native. There are churches everywhere. When I visited Milwaukee, I find the same. So what are used to be historically German or, um, say, Polish, and then Italian, and then Mexican, it's amazing. What's key here is to figure out what's happening with school closings and Catholic school closings, um, church closings, is cuantas hay, donde están? So where are these Catholics? Where are these parishes? And how much do they cost? So I have lots of family here in Chicago. I'm one of four, and I'm the last of my siblings to come to Chicago. And we were raised in Catholic education here. And my nephew, who I had uh, breakfast with this morning, Joaquin Santiago, was four. And I asked how much they're paying for his Catholic education. Right there, next to Midway. More than $4,000. That's middle to high middle class because Chicago is expensive. So I started thinking, my goodness, if it were not for these, quote, ethnic Catholics, who I don't call minorities, I'm not a minority, how do they pay for this? How do they keep the Archdiocese of Chicago, which I believe is the third largest as far as numbers? Again, I'm sure there are experts here, and people who have more of a sociological background. But I find that interesting. We are the present and the future of Catholicism here in Chicago. Not just Spanish, it's Polish, it's also the Filipino, the Central American. We're a very diverse. So part of what I do as a professor here is trying to speak about stereotypes open, openly. And also to help my students, many of them who self-identify with many, many different intersectional uh, identities, to piece together what's happening, especially with the president and the White House administration we have. So some of them are tongue-in-cheek, some of them are funny, but it's also to get them to rethink what it means to be Hispanic, Latino, 
from their own perspective, not from what's coming from outside. That's a complicated dialogue to be having. So when I came to the States, it was, I forget the name that you have this in English. And then I learned that this is in the Art Institute, my love, La Cucaracha, my love of Caracas. He does this amazing uh, cartoon type. Then again, the Pope is Latin American. Yes, he's of Italian background, surprise. <laughs> to be Latin American means to be connected to other parts of the world. And then, you know, fun facts. Some immigrants crossed a field and some crossed an ocean. Some early immigrants were psychopathic criminals. That's just Cristobal Colón. Uh, and again, we can discuss, because from a Latin American perspective, post-colonial theory, uh, I let students know that, you know, he's problematic. Depends on where you are. Puerto Rico is not Peru and Mexico is not Argentina, and how he celebrated or not is very interesting. I do film, I do a lot of films, so I have students see films that are not usually as common. Thanks to Netflix, Roma is what it is. And Rabioso Sol, Rabioso Cielo, Cielo is an amazing film, which is in black and white as well, and speaks to same-sex desire. So this speaks to how in Mexico, in Latin America, we are and have been speaking about gender and pushing boundaries. So let's revisit North America, because we as Mexicans, we are North American. I come to the US and we're not. History with a capital H and then, you know, slanted. Let's speak about big history and then analyze maps. I love looking at maps because borderlands and frontiers keep changing and they're ever changing. Somos transnacionales. Surprise, we are transnational. This is a map that was used by Absolute Vodka, which I believe is a Swedish company, maybe uh, just 2007, 2008, and I use, use this as a platform as I teach, and my students are taken aback and say, oh, how big is Mexico? And for other students, it's nothing about that. It's how smaller it, the US looks compared to what it does today. And as you can guess, at this absolute vodka was not, part, was not very successful in the US <laughs> and very successful in Mexico. <laughs> so again, what I'm gonna, hopefully this link will work correctly. Some of what I try to do is not in a condescending way, but also trying to realize that Tejano, for example, and Southwest um, peoples that are mixed as well, it's a different type of conversation. And you'll understand why I chose Carmen. And this is part of an HBO um, series. So I hope this works. If I click, I'm gonna help the volume. Works. Checked. Is the volume on it? Yes. So that should be it. You'll understand why I chose. You can look through centuries of Latinos being here, and people still look at us and say, I love the way Latinos inspire magic. We can walk right through an American history textbook, and poof, we disappear. It's like people don't even notice we were here at all. You can look through centuries of Latinos being here, and people still look at us and say, oh, you're Latino. Where do you come from? I come from the United States. Yes, but we mean like before you cross the border. I didn't cross the border. No, but like before your parents crossed the border, they didn't cross the border. Well, before your grandparents crossed the border, you know, we were Mexicans. We didn't cross the border. The border crossed us. We were here. Mexican-Americans have at least two different cultural backgrounds. The newcomers were the Spaniards that got here like in the 15th century. The other side of the family was here already. Oh, but that's impossible. The United States didn't even exist till 1776. And I say, exactly. And the part of my family that was here already, 
They were like walking all around on this ground before you guys said that Columbus discovered America. We were standing here, we were walking all around on top of this ground and we didn't even know it was here. We had to wait till somebody from Europe came and told us, it's here. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. I'm so glad you discovered us. We didn't know we were walking around on top of it. Didn't even know America was right here below our noses. We didn't know it was here at all. Yes. Yes. So part of the reason I believe I was invited was because I was the invited director of the Hank Center Mexican Catholic Conference. And this should work? Yes. So if you're curious, you can find more information about everything we did. Um, it'll be five years now. And again, it was a very successful two-day conference that consumed me for months and months and months. Mm -hmm. So again, I'll just scroll, scroll down and you'll see the type of conversations that we had. You know, everything from early Mexican presence, which I'll speak about a little bit, Chicago Mexican parishes, they're many and growing, uh, faith, hope, democracy, café con galletas mexicanas, because we have to eat, and las galletas are wonderful, religiosity, <laughs> matriarchy, Virgen de Guadalupe, which coincides beautifully with this conversation, immigration, transnationalism, cultural identity. The two keynote speakers were uh, Maria Hinojosa and uh, Luis Alberto Urrea. The Hollywood daughter, for those that haven't read, is actually about a young woman who is from the Northwest of Mexico who then ends up in the Southwest US, which is a healer. You know, so for those that haven't read it, I would highly suggest it. Uh, his, his new book is The House of Broken Angels, and it's just literally just out of the press. And I left a few bookmarks and postcards there to speak about, uh, that speaks to a, a festival that I'm a part of and he'll be presenting this book on the same day as the Chicago Marathon. I've been told to speed you along. So these are two emblematic spaces in Chicago that are critical to understanding what it means to be Mexican, Mexicano, Mexicano, Mexicanix. One is the oldest parish of, of uh, Mexican background here in Chicago is the Parroquia de Nuestra Virgen de Guadalupe, Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish which is a 91st year commercial. It's the south side of Chicago, near the, where the Illinois Steel uh, plant used to be. This is 1923. It's documented that as early as the 1893 World's Fair here in Chicago, uh, with now Hyde Park and uh, Washington Park, Jackson Park, there were Mexicans here already, so we're not late. The 1924, the Claritians then came in, and then by 1947, the school. The book that I will recommend, and she spoke and was highlighted during the, the conference, on Emma Martinez, who's now in, is in, in the Netherlands. Catholic Borderlands, Nazi Catholicism, North American Empire, 1905 to 1935. The second place, which is key, this is a photograph. I looked and looked and found one, and then got permission to use it. It's a de la Nuestra Virgen de Guadalupe, Cerrito de Atellac, Shrine of Our Lady Guadalupe, which is pronounced in Midwestern English to Spain, in the north. And this is 1987, where a Mexican man, uh, Senor Joaquin Martinez, came with a statue of La Virgen Guadalupe, and then it became huge. Year by year, it got bigger. By 95, El Cerrito, which is a little mountain, which was back to where the Conacin uh, Virgen de Guadalupe appeared, to Juan Diego, who's now a saint, San Juan Diego, he started to build this. This is gigantic. If you want to go to space where you just feel positive energy, this is where you would go. By 2013, it was finally recognized by the past Cardinal Francis George that this was going to be a holy site and that the first rector, Marco Mercado, would then be the one that you know, would oversee. The book here would be Elaine Peña performing piety, making space sacred with the Virgen de Guadalupe. So again, there are lots of common denominators with my presentation and the two presenters before. So let's look at the image of La Virgen de Guadalupe. This is her full title. Nuestra Virgen de Guadalupe, Reina de México, Emperatriz de América. And again, if you have more time, you can look at that webpage here, which is the official webpage, and it's breathtaking. I believe that after the Vatican, this is the second most visited space, Catholic space in the world. So it's millions. So this is where I know I have about a minute or two left here. This is where things get funky and queer. So when I teach queer theory and masculinity studies, there's a moment when we speak about patriarchy. Actually, it's the first 10 minutes. 
<laughs> and we start asking ourselves, well, what does it mean to be omnipresente, omnisciente, uh, um, oh, omnipresente, omnisciente, y omni, there's another a third, all-knowing, omnipotente, omnipotente uh, all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good, all or, um, or seeing everything from, from, from my standpoint. And what happens if you, or is this even better for you if you walk around with your rosary, which I do, or your scapulary, which I used to have. So this is where things get very interesting for me and as I push forward with my research. Global Catholic studies means high Latinx, Chicanx, Mexicanx, because we're very diverse, many words to use, which is interdisciplinary studies means queer theory. So the name is a song. Tú escudruñas mi senda y mi descanso y desconoces y conoces bien todos mis caminos. English translation. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Here is what happens when you close or don't close your bedroom door and you're not alone. So let me read this. This is from Marcela Maria Antusri, Argentine. Went to Scotland. She's passed on, unfortunately. She's key to my concept of queer God. The queer God introduces a new theology from the margins of sexual deviance and economic exclusion. The queer God creates a concept of holiness that overcomes sexual and colonial prejudices. It is a book about this rediscovery of God outside the heterosexual ideology, which has been prevalent in the history of Christianity theology. In order to do that, it is necessary to facilitate the coming out of the closet of God by a process, by a process of theological query. The theological query, we mean the deliberate questioning of heterosexual experience and thinking which has shaped our understanding of theology, the role of the theologian and hermeneutics. The God who has come out higher perhaps of being pushed to the edge by hegemonic sexual systems and theology has made God's sanctuary on the other side. Our task and our joy is to find or simply recognize God sitting amongst us at any time in a gay bar or in the home of a camp friend who decorates her living room as a chapel and doesn't leave her rosary at home when going to a salsa bar. Mm -hmm. So for time's sake, I'm gonna put some images which speak to themselves. We have Alex Donis, Mary Magdalene and La Virgen de Guadalupe, Doni de Carlo, Chulo de Guadalupe, and Alma Lopez, Our Lady. Very controversial, very provocative. Manuel Munoz, that's what I do more say with Latinx, someone that I really enjoy. The book would be Zigzagger Stories, and that's on that my, my side. So I'll stop here, I have more to share. What's key for me to, to, to share here is that it is, as the, the title I hope makes sense now, it is about a diverse, dynamic population that is ever expanding. And we are still Guadalupanos or Guadalupanes. What's curious here is that you could be an agnostic, you could be a socialist, and still be a Guadalupano, which I find fascinating. In my home, with friends and in my scholarship, I find that there is no contradiction in the state you're a Guadalupano and X, Y, or Z. It complements, it feeds you, it gives you life, and builds family. So I'll stop there. Thank you. to prepare questions for the panel, but we are down to... My apologies. No, no, no. We've started late and we're, we're good. Uh, but we only have about, oh, less than 15 minutes left. So I thought because some of the panels I, some of the panels I sat in on, um, I felt like I wanted an opportunity for the Q&A and the moderator just sort of took over the questions. Maybe we'll start with Q&A. And then if you don't have questions, I'll take over. Does that sound good? Okay, let's start, let's start with the Q&A so that the panelists have an opportunity to respond to things that you're thinking about. Thank you for your presentations. Um, just uh, wondering how you uh, navigate in the work or the authors you have presented or your study, that kind of insider-outsider perspective regarding belonging to the Catholic tradition, right? In many ways, there's so much, you know, fluidity and, and freedom to relate in many ways, being a socialist or an atheist and a Guadalupano, right? Uh, but I also imagine that sometimes it becomes like a struggle to, to figure out how much one 
belongs or not to the tradition in which ways. I just wonder, you know, like how that plays a role in your work, in the work people you admire or, or study. Do you want to stand here? This is work. As I as I alluded to at the beginning of, of my of my paper, read, reading Dana Joya's. I mean, for a long time, I, I'm a cradle Catholic. Went to Catholic school for twelve years. Uh, teach at a Catholic university, um, but I would probably describe myself as more cultural culturally Catholic. But Dana Joya's essay, I, I thought, created a space to enlarge the tent. And in fact, yesterday he made a really interesting comment in which he talked about practicing Catholics, uh, cultural Catholics, and even people who don't consider themselves Catholic, but because they grew up in that environment and with that imagery, it still is in their work, whether they whether they want to acknowledge it or not. So that has made it um, easier to be to be part of the conversation. The other thing I'll say, and I'm going to borrow something that was said by a. Puerto Rican poet named Uray Juan Noel, who was talking about the Latinx identity. And he said something that I thought was very useful. He's, he said he's not interested in trying to pin down what it is. He's more interested in the conversation surrounding the question. And, and I would probably say the same thing as well, that being engaged in the conversation is what's interesting as opposed to trying to definitively define things in a categorical way. I mean, I guess just on a very basic level as a writer, um, I, I'm always a little bit on the outside. I think, I, I think a lot of writers are. Um, and certainly, you know, from the time I was little, we, we moved around a lot. I was, my family was really itinerant. And so I was constantly an outsider in the communities we moved into. And so that, that feeling of being feeling a bit outside of things, or, or you know, if I am inside, I, you know, that, that, that question of whether I'm in, an inside or outsider is always there for me, and, um, you know, it, it, in, in all aspects of my life, and also in my identity as a, as a Catholic, and it's, it's always there. I think it's generational from, my, from, from what I piece together and from what I read. I write, I'm someone that's very visual, so I bring all the books that inspire me. I find that even certain individuals who you would think would not be as open to what we would say fluidity, una fluidez de identidades, say a 70, 80 year old woman or a 70, 80 year old man, might be your grandfather, might be your grandmother, tu madrina, tu padrino. If you do open up a dialogue and you do just discuss what it means to be X, Y, or Z, it's transforming, it's changing constantly. Uh, I sometimes find more resistance from certain people who are questioning less what it means to be even just a human being or a, or, or a citizen of, of a country like the United States or Mexico. If they question less, then maybe they're more drawn to a certain type of authoritative figure. And I find that, especially teaching here at Loyola as a Catholic, as a Jesuit university, I find that it's the women who are asking more of the questions. And they push boundaries more and are comfortable wanting to ask why. <laughs> and I like that a lot. I think it's harder for a young man to question his privilege, for instance, than it is for a young woman. Class does matter here. So does ethnic self-identification. So I do find that the Catholicism that is used as an umbrella term of like Latinx Catholics in the US, and then you go to Spain, and then you speak to Brazilians, or go to Argentina or Mexico. I sometimes find that what's here classified as Latinx, and more specifically Catholic Latinx experience or religiosity, is a lot more static than what's really happening there. So one of the things that I think is uh, really interesting about this panel is that Latinidad is a, a thing only within the U.S., right? And um, but this, this construct that we, we've had to do because, because that's the way we're lumped uh, when, when Latin America is so crazy diverse. Yes. Just the thing, just what you mentioned. 
And what's interesting is that, you know, if you, if you talk about Latinidad within Catholicism, right? So Latinidad within American Catholicism, that's kind of an interesting thing because um, are we are we what? Are, are we an, an exotic component and <laughs> spice to the life of American Catholicism? Or are we an essential, like, you know? And, and then that, to me, seems to mirror a lot of the conversations about who are we within the United States, right? As, as the U.S. is changing demographically, um, are, are, are we a minority group? Are we a group at all? Are we an essential component? Um, and so I was wondering what, in, in your work, in your writing, as you grapple with these issues of, of your identity, your Catholicism, your Latinidad, um, how do you make sense of any of these things? <laughs> I'll start by just saying a little bit about my institution. Uh, the, the 2019 is the 20th anniversary of the Institute for Latino Studies at Notre Dame. And the narrative they offer 20 years ago was surveying the landscape of the U.S., the evolving demographics, and realizing that the future of the Catholic Church in the U.S. is Latinx. And so Notre Dame made the decision to respond by creating the Institute for Latino Studies, because they like to think of themselves as, as one of the you know, pr premier Catholic universities in the US. So I would say that um, depends on who's in charge. If, if you look at the numbers, um, I, I, I don't know the numbers by heart, but I would, I would imagine that the percentage of Catholics who are Latino is probably pretty high. But the people who are in, you know, in positions of power I imagine the numbers are, are, are reverse. So it depends on who you, who you speak to. So I, don't, I wouldn't think that uh, the Latino presence in the US Catholic Church is, is spice. I think we're the, we're the, we're the, meat, the meat. I don't have a ready answer. <laughs> Good question. Um, from a Mexican standpoint, and being me me Mexican centric, slightly, poquito, <laughs> con orgullo, this year is the 80th year that commemorates the exiled refugiados republicanos. This is a 20 to 30,000 that fled Franco, 19, when that regime, following Mussolini and Hitler, Franco. The Mexican government at the time with uh, Lázaro Cárdenas was a socialist left wing. Uh, if you look at U.S. history, 1924 is the year that the U.S. government decided to have quotas by nation. Certain countries were in, and certain countries were out. Back then, in the 20s and 30s, certain countries from the Mediterranean, including Italy, was not, they were not seen as favorable immigrants. Eastern Europeans, which was called for maybe Jewish, Ashkenaz. So the Mexican government at that time, by 39, with Lázaro Cárdenas, Thousands, many of them were left-leaning in Segunda República, meaning they wanted women to vote. They wanted um, educación laica, lay like education, sure. not religious education. So they were pretty revolutionary. The Mexican Revolution had happened. Mexicans had been thinking about that the intelligentsia. So you have in Mexico, you know, people who are part of, say, La Iberoamericana, which is a Catholic institution, which have the sons or daughters or grandchildren of these individuals who came from a different tradition. I'm not sure if I'm answering your you know, complete question here, but thinking of that specifically, we celebrate that diversity if you want, but everyone's still just Mexicano. You know? Are you Lebanese like Carlos Slim? Está bien. So I think we're less caught up as in comparison to the United States. I think there's a lot that has to happen here and again, as I mentioned before, I don't consider myself a minority. I speak the second most spoken language in the world. But it depends on who's in power and who's speaking and who's publishing. You know, it's amazing how when we go from one space to the next, you're, you are who you are and who you're perceived to be. You know, so what languages do you speak? Or you're assumed to speak because of your last name or your appearance. Um, so I think Chicago, and, you know, to be Chicago-centric again, is a very unique place because things are changing quickly here, and the Catholic Church in their diocese has to mirror more of what's happening in the Midwest as well. So I'll stop there. Uh, 
revolutionary and beautiful concept of the clearing of God. How do you, how does a person, or have you noticed people experiencing love from God or the church in that embodiment? <laughs> you also <laughs> spoke of that. You have poets who are speaking to that. I'll speak to what happens in the classroom, I guess, in okay. students. Some have cried because for them it's a moment to finally say, I can hold her hand. So I say something that is radical, and I have a colleague from my department here. I tell them, no sin, no hell, no shame, no guilt. I write that on the blackboard, and let's proceed with our conversations. And some will say, oh, but in my high school, or my Mormon background, or my Methodist background, I say, I say, let's build this conversation. And I think that's critical. So Catholic religiosity is changing and transforming. Now it is 2019, and people like myself do walk around with, you know, a rosary, or the image of the Virgen. And it's not just Mexicans, the Italians, the Poles. And you go to your grandmother's house and you're like, well, Grandma, mine had passed on, had passed Wisconsin, but I'm like, I'm turning into you. And I love that. <laughs> because then, no, but for the younger generation, I think, call them millennials or what you want, I think they're more open, period. But some of them are faith-based. Some of them do want a Jesuit education, a Catholic education. So I think that's critical as well. This is the history for histories. But I think with desire, love, intimacy, it's taboo subjects for some. But we have to explore those. And we have the authors, the experts here. Just to say we're at time, so I'll let you respond and then we might have to close. Um, I'll just briefly say the, the book I'm publishing in, in May called After Ruben is a reference to Ruben Darío. And one portion of the book uh, talks about, um, I guess you might call it a controversy that emerged in 2012 when Arizona State University uh, uncovered, uh, I think it was nine, nine letters uh, from Ruben Darío to Amado Nervo. Mexican poet, which revealed for the first time, according to the letters, that there, that there had been an intimate relationship between them. The scholar who uncovered those letters, a guy named Alberto Acereda, I'm told, was immediately sort of, became a pariah in certain literary circles for suggesting that Ruben Darío may have been involved in a queer, queer relationship. And one, my project in, in, the, in the book is I've, I've actually, revisited some translations that I've done of his work in which I take into account this new information and act accordingly in, in my translations of, of some of his work. Um, so my pro part of the, my project then is, is querying Ruben Darío based on, based on these letters. Thank you all. I'm sorry we don't have any more time. I'm sure